Okay, so welcome back. Now, today we are going to talk about something called Fortran. And we're going to give kind of an overview, introduction to what is Fortran. Um, we're going to write a little bit of code and uh, hopefully give you an idea of what it is, how to work with it, how to install it, and whether it might be beneficial for you to uh, consider working with. So, let's step back and see what really is Fortran. Well, Fortran is a programming language. And the name Fortran is derived from formula translation. And as you can probably guess from that name, it was developed uh, as a scientific engineering programming language. And it was developed way back in the 1950s at a company called IBM, International Business Machines. And for those who are, of us who have been around for many years, you know that IBM was the leader of the world in mainframe large computers. And um, you may also recognize these two images that we'll talk about here. But basically, Fortran is a programming language developed long ago, about 60 years ago. And it was geared towards science, engineering, research applications. So why should anybody consider Fortran? Well, um, that's kind of a tough question. Um, apparently, there's a lot of legacy code out there that people still need to work with. Um, lots of, I, it sounds like lots of universities and research facilities have code that was built, you know, 50, 60 years ago in Fortran, and it works, right? I mean, there's an old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I think there's a lot of code out there that works and it's really, um, there's no reason to go spend all the money and time to update your code to something like C or C++ if it works, okay? You know, it also highlights what, you know, for those of us who have been in the engineering world for many years, um, it highlights the fact that technology doesn't change that much. It's more, as they say, it's more evolutionary than revolutionary. Um, if you look at Fortran code, which we'll do in a bit here, compared to some newer code like C++ or C or C Sharp, it's not really that different. Um, it's, it's evolved. Um, definitely the programming languages have evolved over the years to make them easier to use and that kind of thing and add a little bit more functionality. But at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're assigning variables, you're calculating signs, you're doing inputs and outputs. It's about the same core functionality as we've had for 50, 60 years. Um, for me, it's basically I'm doing this because it's kind of a stroll down memory lane. Um, I recently saw a video, somebody talking about Fortran. And I said, oh yeah, I remember that from back in engineering school back in the 70s and 80s. And um, for those of us who were around at that time in school, you might recognize these images. And Fortran started out uh, the way that engineering students would enter Fortran code is they would go to a device like this, a mechanical device. It was a tabletop device where you would take some uh, cards. These were cardboard, thin cardboard cards and you would uh, punch the cards so that each card contained one line of Fortran code. So for example, this card down here, this Fortran statement, would be the, the line of code that said X equals five, okay? So you would take a blank card and you would put it into this device in the top right bin here, and there was a, a motor in here that would automatically feed that card into this spot right here above the, the uh, terminal, the keypad, and you would type X equals five into the keypad, and it would automatically punch holes into this card that corresponded to X equals five. And you could see on the left of the card, you've got five or six lines that were solely for line numbers. Uh, in the early days of Fortran, you would number each line. And then on the right, you would have your statement and it could only be 132, I believe, 132 characters long. Um, and you would just type um, your line of code, one on each card. You punch it, and then it would send that card out to your stack over here. And the next card comes down, you punch the next line, and it adds to the stack. 
And when you're all done pipe, typing in your code, you would have a stack of, you know, 100 cards or 300 cards or 500 cards. And you would take all those cards, put them in a cardboard box, and walk them over to the mainframe computer room where they had like an IBM 360 computer and give them to the person there who was entering the cards. And um, they would put those cards into the mainframe and it would read the cards and um, you would come back in the afternoon or maybe the next day and look on the shelf. They would have printed out for you a folding line of paper that was, you know, could be 10, 20, 30 feet long that just folded. It was like maybe two feet by one feet sheets of paper. They were all folded and you would look through it, would print out your code and would also print out an error message that said, in card 361, you left out a period. And then you would take your cards and you say, oh my goodness. And you go find card 361 and redo it and put in a new card that had the correct period. So that's the, the beginnings of Fortran. Um, thankfully, now you can do it on a terminal. And we're going to show you how to install it on your computer. And you can do the same thing on your um, computer and you can run the code on your computer. So what are the pros and cons of Fortran? Well, I really don't have a lot. I honestly, it's a tool like any other programming language. If you like it, then fine. If not, then fine. There's really, again, these are all evolutionary, not revolutionary changes. So it may be fine for you. It may be um, perfect for what you need. Um, Personally, it, it's got some limitations that make it not really usable for what I need, but that doesn't mean it's it's not usable. So some of the pros and cons I came up with, um, again, it's scientific and engineering based, so it's got some nice features associated with arrays. It's kind of like MATLAB. Um, it's got some nice, uh, when you're dealing with arrays, it's got some nice features. For example, if you're dealing with, for example, C Sharp or C++, your arrays are all assumed to have a zero-based index. So if you've got a five-element array, you access them based on A0 through A4, not A1 through A5. With Fortran, you can specify, I want the array indices to be one through five instead of zero to four. Or you can say, I want them to be two through six. So it's, it's really nice. It's got that functionality that you can assign your um, indices. Whether that matters to you is up to you. It's nice to have. For me, I don't really care too much. Um, Fortran's lightweight. Um, you'll hear people saying, well, it's used in uh, astronomical calculations and it may be faster than C or C++ in some cases. I don't care about that. Um, you may, it may be important to you. Um, as far as other pros, I don't know of any. Uh, it's a programming language. You know, it is what it is. As far as some cons, just from somebody who's come into it from the outside and hasn't used it in many years, of course, it's kind of limited. Um, you know, with C Sharp, for example, you can drag and drop libraries and you can access tons of different code. With Fortran, that's very limited. Um, there may be, if you want to spend money on a um, compiler IDE from Intel or something, there may be lots of libraries. But for somebody who's starting out and wants the free stuff, um, you're going to have a hard time finding stuff. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, but you're going to have to be searching around to get what, what might seem to be very um, basic uh, functionality. For example, um, if you want to read from a USB port or a serial port, Keep in mind that back in the 70s and 80s, there weren't, the USB didn't exist back until the, like the 90s. So if you're going to want to read from a USB or serial port, you're going to have to do some legwork and see if there's something out there. I haven't been able to find anything that talks about USB and Fortran. Again, you may have to spend some money to get some specialized libraries. Um, there's a bunch of other cons, but to me, it's just the big question is why? You know, why would you want to use Fortran? If you have to, yeah. If you've got legacy code you need to work with, um, that's fine. If you don't, you know, there's MATLAB out there. There's C, C++, C Sharp. There's so many other alternatives that give you a lot of functionality. So the question is, why do you really need to do it? 
again, that doesn't mean it's not useful, but for, you know, you just got to decide whether it's something that you could, you could find useful. So what we're going to do here is we're going to show how to get up to speed very quickly to use Fortran. And um, I'm going to use Linux Mint to do it because I found it to be a little bit easier. And I just happen to have a laptop that's dual boot with Windows 10 and Linux Mint. And I tend to use the, the Linux Mint for, you know, just trying things out in Linux. So we're going to show how to install the compiler called gfortran on Linux Mint. It's a one-line command, very easy to do. A plotter to do um, different types of plots called GNU plot. Again, a single line of uh, command line to get that installed. And we're also going to show how to install and use an IDE called Code Blocks. And it's nice because it recognizes Fortran and it automatically works with this gfortran compiler and it's very easy to get your fortran compiler up and running and write your your code in this IDE and it, it's all very seamless. There's many other ways to do it and we'll mention those a little bit but um, this is the method that I found that's the quickest and easiest to get up to speed just to start writing some fortran code. And then what we're going to do is going to write some examples. We're going to look at what are called functions and subroutines. Uh, we're going to build some uh, arrays of complex numbers and show how to work with those. And then we're going to read and plot a CSV file. Okay, so here I am in Linux Mint. And I'm going to start installing three uh, packages that we're going to need. We need a compiler, we need a plotter, and we need the IDE. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my terminal and I'm going to install gfortran, which is the compiler. It's very simple. You do the standard sudo, super user, apt-get, space install, space gfortran. And you run that and mine's already installed, but it will go through and install it. Now you can also do that, I believe, with the software manager. Just search for gfortran. And you'll get a gfortran and just install that. Now the next thing, once you've got gfortran, you've got the compiler and you're all set. Now we need to install the GNU plot. Okay, so it's the same thing. sudo apt-get space install space gnuplot. So I'll run that. Mine's already installed. And again, you can do this on the software manager. Uh, gnuplot. And you should see GNU plot um, listed there. Take your pick on how you want to do it. So now we've got all of them done. Uh, and the last thing we're going to need is the IDE. And that is code blocks with two colons in between the code and the blocks. But uh, it's listed here, code blocks. I've got that already installed. Uh, integrated Development Environment IDE. So you just install that and you should be all set to go. Now you can write your code, you can plot things, and you can, um, and you've got your compiler all set to go. Okay, so now I've got gfortran, GNU plot, and code blocks installed. So I'm at my uh, desktop in Linux Mint and I'm going to go over and I'm going to start up code blocks IDE. So I double click on code blocks and here is the interface for code blocks. And you can see over here is the, on the left side, I've got the workspace, which basically is going to list all the folders and components in my project. Not too different from Visual Studio. And um, here is where I'm going to have my code in the middle. And then down here I can show my um, terminal data as I do my um, building and compiling it shows the results so the first thing i want to do is i want to go create a new project here in the middle so i click on that and you can see it's very nice it's got a list of all the possible types of projects you can build um, i've got an arduino um, i've got fortran dll fortran application fortran library i've got matlab uh, opencv opengl powerpc uh, QuickTime, WX Widgets. So there's a lot of uh, good things that you can build in here. So what I can do is I can further filter that, go up to the category and go to Fortran 
And here's all the Fortran related stuff. I can make a DLL, Fortran application, or Fortran library. So I'm going to click on Fortran library and hit go. So it's now welcome to the new Fortran project wizard and go to next. So let's say project title Fortran stuff. And it's going to go to your home slash whatever your username documents and create the project there. Or you can select over here to, to select some other location. And then it's got a file name for the project of CBP. And the resulting file name is going to be this. So I go to next. And here I want to select instead of GNU GCC, I want to go down and go to GNU Fortran Compiler. That's what we just downloaded, uh, Fortran Compiler. All right, and then um, leave these as default. And we got the de debug and release configurations. Hit finish. And here we go. We've got over here on the left our basically our project, and it's got our Fortran source code. And main.f90 is our main code right here. And it's already given us a sample Hello World application. So this is in Fortran. And what we can do is we can modify this to however we want. So really nice. It recognizes your Fortran compiler and gives you a, um, a sample Fortran code. And you're ready to go. So now let's take a look at some of the basic um, formatting for a Fortran uh, program. You can see that it was automatically named main.f90. And typically, what I like to do is I like to name my source code with a .f90. Uh, it's generally just a text file, but I use a .f90 to show that it's a Fortran uh, program. And then here I've got my project and I've got the code and here's the main.f90. So again, this is just a um, hello world application, but it shows some of the typical formatting and structures of a Fortran program. Um, I've got the declaration. It's a program called hello. And unlike, uh, for example, C++, C sharp, in order to define the scope of the program, you have the program and then a final uh, statement set that says end program. In C sharp, for example, you would have curly brackets to define the scope. But here uh, you have to say end program. OK, um, again, we've evolved a little bit to make it a little bit easier, but still nothing earth shattering. Now you'll see the first line is called implicit none. Now, way back when um, Fortran started out, with assuming that any variable name starting with the letter i through the letter n was an integer, just to make life a little easier. So if you wanted an integer, instead of naming the integer a, you would just say j equals 2, and it automatically knows that j is an integer. Um, some people don't like that. Personally, I don't like it. I like to be able to specify in my code exactly what type of um, variable it is. So this says implicit none. This says, OK, compiler, don't make any assumptions. Make me specify for each variable what type of variable it is. So then I have to say integer a equals 6. OK, I need to specify that a is an integer. All right. Now, um, you can see that um, I'm not going to go into the detail of all the types of variables and everything. Uh, one other thing, there's no, there's no semicolon at the end. You don't need a semicolon. And then I've got a print statement that prints to the console. And this asterisk means print to the console. And here is the string that I'm going to print. Again, I'm not going to get into the details of this right now, but this is just the basic structure. So I can go up here and you see the gear does a build and then I do a run or I can do a build and run. So I'm going to do a build and run. And you can see I immediately get an error. And the error was, is with this integer declaration. And this is one of the things you have to remember about Fortran. And one of the, what I consider one of the annoyances is when you specify a variable, you use double colons between the type and the actual specification. 
So even if I don't want to assign it a value of 6, I need to say integer colon colon a. And then I can run it, and you can see it will print hello world. But again, this is one of the things about Fortran you got to remember. Always remember your colon colon when you're specifying a variable. All right? So that's basically it with the general layout. Okay, so now let's look at a piece of code I wrote. And we're going to step through this. I'm not going to rewrite it for you. If you want to copy it, you can just pause the video and copy. But this is a very simple Fortran um, piece of code that is going to do some very simple things. We're going to walk through how we can implement this. So um, here I've got my program called Fortran Demo. And you can see at the end, like we said before, I've defined the scope down to here. We're in program Fortran Demo. And this is the Fortran Demo code in between those two um, lines. And again, I've got my implicit none because I want to specify each variable specifically. I want to be explicit instead of implicit. So what this code is going to do, it's going to take user input for two values, x and y, and it's going to provide two answers. It's going to add x and y and give the answer, and it's going to multiply x and y and give the answer, okay? So I am here defining x and y as real values. That's what the user is going to tell me the values. And again, I'm defining it as real, which is like a double, kind of like a double in C sharp. And I've got, I need the two colons, and I'm defining x and y, x and y as real. I'm doing the same for the answers, the add answer and the multiply answer, okay? Now, to get those answers, I'm going to use two different ways to get the answer. For the, for the addition of the two, I'm going to use what's called a function. And a function is very much like a method in C Sharp, where you give it some values and it returns a value. So I'm going to give it x and y, it's going to return the add answer. The multiply answer, I'm going to get using a subroutine which is very much like a function, but kind of different. Um, it's generally where you provide input values and it operates on those and changes those values. But it's not always that way, so it's a little bit confusing. But anyway, we're going to use a function to add and a subroutine to multiply, all right? Now, to do the add, I am defining my function with this line. I'm saying it's real, and it's an external function called add, all right? So I'm defining it as a real external add. And down here, outside of my main program, I've got my little add function, okay? We'll get into that. So I'm defining my, my real, my external function. And here I've just got the um, the code to get the x and y values from the user. I'm printing star, which means to the terminal, and it's going to say enter x and y, and then I'm reading x and y as those variables. So let, let me run this to show you how this works. So it's going to say enter x and y, 2.3 comma 5.6, and you can see I've got x equals this, 2.3, 5.6, the addition of those two is 7.9, and um, the multiplication is 12.8798. So that's what this is going to basically do, um, and it's also going to output to a CSV, which we'll talk about. So here I've just done the enter x and y, and the u it waits for the user to enter x and y, and then I am going to call the external function, the add function, which is down here. And I am going to say, add those two numbers and give me the answer. And here's the add answer. For the multiply, I'm going to use an internal subroutine. And um, again, the subroutine is kind of like a void method with no return value in C sharp or something. However, there's a however you can also have it output, so uh, kind of confusing. But anyway, um, here I'm going to call my subroutine, which is called mult, and I'm going to feed it in x and y, and it's going to send out the answer as mult answer, okay? And that subroutine is inside this main program, which we'll get to. 
So I'm calling MULT, feeding X and Y, and getting MULT answer, which we already defined up here. Now, I'm also going to send this to a CSV file, and here's how you do that. I first open the file, and it's very straightforward to open a file. I'm going to open it, and I have this 10 here, which is the, the definition of the file. It's unit 10, and I'm giving it a name, fortranout.csv. And I'm saying file equals fortranout.csv. So it's going to open this, and it's going to refer to it as unit 10. That's the number for this file. And then I'm going to write to number 10, add answer, the answer from the addition, comma, multiply answer. And then it's going to close that file. All right. So then we're going to get a CSV file with only a addition value, comma, multiplication value, and close it. So very simple to output to a CSV. And then we're going to send the answers to the terminal with print statements like we did before. We're going to print x equals and then x comma y equals y and then add answer equals comma add answer and so on. Now here is the subroutine for doing the multiplication and I'm calling it subroutine mult and I'm feeding two values a and b and it's going to bring me out it's going to return this c value. Now, one of the things you need to know about this is you need a contains statement to say that this program contains this subroutine. So this is kind of a subprogram inside the main program. So you're defining this as a uh, subroutine inside the main. So I'm calling it subroutine, giving it a name, and I'm able to define these first two as input variables and this third one is an output. I'm saying to do the to define A and B as inputs, I'm saying real, that they're real values, and the intent with A and B is that they are input. All right? So A and B, they are real. The intent is that they are input values in the colon colon A and B. And then C is an output. So real, comma, intent out, colon, colon, C. So that defines that I got two coming in and one going out. And I'm simply calculating C equals A times B, and then I'm ending the subroutine. So whenever you call this mult, you feed it to and you get the output um, as C. So when I called the subroutine here, I said mult, I'm feeding in X and Y, and the answer is mult answer. Okay? So nice and clean, uh, a little bit different from what you may be used to with other languages. But again, it functionally does the same thing. And the last thing we got here is our external function, uh, which we already addressed. It's the add x and y. And here also I can specify an output. And I'm saying that is the sum, and that's where the result goes. And so it's kind of like the subroutine. But here I'm specifying the inputs are the x and y. And I'm specifically saying the result is sum. So here it's just like a program. I've got implicit none. Uh, real intent in is x and y. And if I am specifying result is sum, it knows that the sum, which is x plus y, is going out. So when I call the um, add, um, it's going to, I feed it in x and y, it's going to give me the add answer because I have said the result equals sum, which is x plus y. So that's um, how you can do a simple Fortran program using subroutines and functions. Okay, now here's another demo of um, some of the array capabilities of Fortran. And what I'm going to do, I've just got my program array demo, and you can see it ends here in program array demo, and it's fairly brief. What this does is it generates a array, a three by three array of complex numbers, A plus JB or A plus IB. And each element is going to have a random number assigned to it. So it's, I'm going to generate arrays of random complex numbers from zero to 10. So each A plus JB 
is going to be from a value from 0 to 10 random. Okay, so um, let's go through and see how we do this. So I've got my program, again, implicit none, because I want to specify all of the values. I'm specifying i and j, which are going to be incrementers, as I set up my array, as integer. And I've got the colon, colon, never forget the colon, colon. Now I'm also going to, um, for each value that I've um, generated in the array, a plus jb, I'm going to calculate a magnitude and angle in degrees for each of those elements and print those to the screen. Um, so I have a real value for magnitude and angle and also to convert from degrees from radians to degrees I'm using this pi conversion uh, variable that I'm going to generate. So I'm just uh, defining my integers and my reals and here is my array and it's a complex array comma with a dimension of three by three colon, colon, and I'm calling it comp array. All right, so I'm just defining my variables here. And I've got another real, but this is a parameter, which is kind of a constant, colon, colon, and I'm calling it pi, and I'm just calculating pi four times arctangent of 1.0. From the pi value that I calculate, I'm doing a conversion 180 degrees per um, pi radians, okay? So here's my pi conversion, so I can multiply times this to convert from uh, radians to degrees. So here is my do loop to generate and print out the values, all right? Uh, in Fortran, there's a do loop. In C sharp, for example, it's a for loop. It's very similar. So I'm going from one to three. Uh, again, I've got my um, array is going to be uh, from 1 to 3, not 0 to 2. So I'm going from 1 to 3 for the x and 1 to 3 for the y. And my complex array i and j is this. And what I'm doing is I'm casting these two values to a complex number. So cmplx is the way you cast the a and b values of the complex. And I'm using this rand function, which returns a random value from 0 to 1, a pseudo-random value from 0 to 1, multiplying it times 10, and that will give me my each element of the complex array, okay? So then I am printing that out, and I'm using this format statement. So when I say print 10, that will use the format statement, which is on line number 10, and I'm going to print it with this format, with a with an F6.3, which gives me three decimal points, with a um, string of plus J, and then the um, B value, or the X, or the Y value. Okay, so I'm just printing out the value. Let me run this to show you. Uh, here is the result, so it's going to print out the random uh, complex number, then calculate the magnitude and the angle. And then the next element, complex number, the magnitude, and the angle, and so on. So I'm printing that out, and here I am getting the magnitude for each element by using this complex absolute value of the element, complex array i and j. And the angle is arctangent of the y value over the x value, which is ai magnitude over real. So it's taking the r tangent and then using this pi conversion to convert to degrees. So here's my angle in degrees and here's my magnitude. And then I just print out, like we saw, the magnitude and angle with this format, f6.2. All right, so here's you got the magnitude and angle with f6.2. So that is basically how easy it is to do um, arrays and complex arrays in Fortran. Um, not too different from other languages. Now in this last bit of code, we're going to show how to plot data from a CSV file. And it's really very straightforward. We're going to use the GNU plot that we installed before. And here's my main code 
I called it graphing.f90, and you can see program plot underscore CSV and program plot underscore CSV. And all it does is calls from the terminal using a call system, and it's, it um, implements this command, GNU plot space dash P space data underscore plot dot PLT. And all this does is says, okay, GNU plot, do your thing and use this data plot dot PLT file, which is going to tell you exactly what to do. So very simple. And what we also have to do is generate in a text editor, this data plot dot PLT. And I've got it here in um, code blocks in the editor. And all it does is it sets the parameters of the plot. So what this is going to do is it is going to basically read in a CSV file that I grabbed from an oscilloscope trace and it's going to plot it. So let's hit the build and run. And here you can see GNU plot has plotted my CSV trace. And you can see the Y axis says volts, X axis says time. And it's, uh, this was a zero to five volt peak with a two and a half volt offset. And um, I told it to put file equals scope trace dot CSV. And you can see it does a nice job of plotting my trace. You can modify all of this stuff, but this is just the basic uh, plot. So um, basically this GNU plot relies on this data plot dot PLT to um, define all of those parameters for the plot. So let's look at the data plot dot PLT, which is basically a text file that I generated. And I've got all these parameters. And first one says, I want the X label to say time, which it does. I want the Y label to say volts. And since I'm reading in a data file, um, a CSV data file, I want to specify the data file space separator in uh, quotes is a comma. So this says, hey, it's a CSV file. Make sure you recognize the comma separator. The name of the file is scope trace.csv and it's located in this local um, project folder. So that's the dot forward slash scope trace.csv. Uh, set terminal x11 to zero. I forget what that is, but you got to have it. Uh, set no key, which basically says I don't want a legend on the um, plot. Uh, I do want a grid, so I set grid. And um, I want the title up top to say file equals scope trace.csv. And here's the parameters. I want to plot this M file using one to two. And that basically says I want column one and column two to be plotted. And this is just a time versus voltage. So it just says use column one for time, column two for voltage. And I want to use lines between each point. Okay, so this is the resulting plot. So really very straightforward. Um, GNU plot is really, really powerful and functional. This is just very basic. You can do a lot, a lot of customizing in GNU plot. It's really wonderful. But just for a basic plot, um, this is the kind of stuff you do. So basically, you got a CSV file. You use the dot plot file to specify how you want it done, what file you want to use. And it's uh, easy to do. So anyway, that's some of the basic implementations of Fortran and a little background. Um, I hope that helps. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.